New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. In the late summer of 1942, the 1st Marine Division of the United States Marines sought to wrest Guadalcanal from the Japanese Empire. We'll meet one of only two reporters on hand to record the carnage as this spot in the Pacific earned its nickname, the Island of Death. But first, hello, history lovers, and welcome. You know me, I am your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. And a special tip of the hat to everybody watching today's time travel adventure via our YouTube channel. And I do appreciate you subscribing there, telling a friend, doing all those trite things that are just housekeeping that people who do this sort of thing are always reminding you to do. You can also find me at historyauthor.com and across social media platforms. Plus you can read my columns in the New York Sun to get my analysis of current events through the lens of what I've learned from all of these books behind me. In this episode, our time machine travels back to war zones of the 20th century to meet an intrepid, fearless journalist who told soldier stories to the folks back home. Our guide on this journey is Ray E. Boomhauer, a senior editor at the Indiana Historical Society Press, biographer, and former reporter who brings us Richard Tregascus, reporting under fire from Guadalcanal to Vietnam. Earning a name as one of the most distinguished combat reporters of the Second World War, Richard Tregascus later reported on the Korean and Vietnam conflicts. He covered those and he lived a life that is explored here for the very first time in this book. You can visit our guest at rayboomhauer.blogspot.com and find him on Twitter at Ray Boomhauer. And you can also check out this or a dozen other books he's written while you're there. Okay, now that we've joined the soldiers fighting battles against fascist and communist foes, let's join Ray Boomhauer and meet Richard Trugaskis. And here we are with Ray Boomhauer. He's joining us to chat about Richard Trugaskis, reporting under fire from Guadalcanal to Vietnam. Thank you so much for making the time to chat with the History Author Show. Dean, it's great to be with you. Thank you. I want to point people, whether they're watching via YouTube, it's easy. You can see, I'll scroll a picture here of the cover or people at home go to Amazon, look at the picture. While you're there, you can buy the book, of course. But it it was striking, the picture. He's has such a big smile on his face, does Richard Trugaskis. He looks like a guy you'd want to open up to, even if you were a soldier in wartime. Imagine you're you're in the misery that is Guadalcanal or a place like Vietnam during during that war in the jungle. And you see this big smile. I don't know that he wore it all the time, but as a person, what was he like? Who is the man you introduce us to in your book, Richard Trugaskis, reporting under fire from Guadalcanal to Vietnam? And how did he use his personality, maybe even that big smile, to get soldiers who are risking their lives, don't know if they're gonna see the next morning, to open up so that he could tell people back home on the home front what's happening over there. Well, if you look at the picture of uh, Tregasis on the cover, you can see he's a very tall individual. And he even said himself that he was an unlikely figure to be a war correspondent because of his height, his uh, thin frame, and the fact that uh, he uh, wore eyeglasses and where it's very nearsighted. But he had attributes that really helped him when he went into action uh, in World War II to talk to the everyday soldier, uh, sailor, or airman. Uh, He was uh, very determined, he was very outgoing, and he was brave, sometimes even foolhardy, in being willing to risk his life to get the story. So he was able to go up as close to the front as possible And when soldiers saw this, they realized that here was someone who was willing to risk the same dangers that they were undergoing in combat, and they were more than willing to uh, talk to him. Uh, There's a famous story from General uh, Vandegraaff on Guadalcanal. They were under fire from the Japanese offshore, 
And as the shelling is going on and uh, people are running around trying to take cover, he hears the sound of typing coming from somewhere. And he's wondering what's going on. And he realizes it's uh, Tregascus typing away uh, in the dark. And he said, it's okay, General, I'm using the touch system. I don't need any light. And that, I think that <laughs> shows his, the determination he had to get the story no matter what and get it back home uh, to the readers um, that he was uh, sending his stories to for the International News Service, a, a wire agency of the time period. I want to make a quick note on your mention of eyeglasses and somebody nearsighted. This is a real liability when you're out there and it's so easy. It's dirty. You're in cramped quarters. You may not even have anything clean to wipe the glasses off. Right. And Theodore Roosevelt, who was also extremely nearsighted, went to war in Cuba with the Rough Riders. He had his wife sew spare play pairs of spectacles, pince nez into his uniform so that he would always have one because if you're blind, you're done. That's that's the kind of challenge he was willing to to face and risk being blinded, which I think for any one of us is is terrifying to think that we might be out there groping around, not know which way the friendly lines are. It's really a, a small thing, but a very human thing. And to me, it tells me about who this man, Richard Tregascus, was. I, I want to go back to his growing up to see how he became that man, how he ended up there in the jungle, in Guadalcanal, in Vietnam, in Korea, which we shouldn't forget. He's born in 1916. So by my eye, it's just as World War One is winding down, he probably becomes a toddler. He's, he's not aware of anything yet, but he grows up in those interwar years and he experiences the Great Depression. So he, he would have been aware of all that going on. What was it about him? What influenced him in those interwar years to decide, I want to become a reporter, a journalist, but not just that. I, I want to go there and I want to tell the stories of the men that are fighting on the front lines in places and even at the risk of my own life. How does he become that man in those interwar years? Well, he was a very keen reader as a young person growing up in uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey. He had a wide range of interests, loved to swim, loved to uh, collect minerals. But that reading, that being able to uh, kind of drawn to stories of uh, people at war uh, for ideals. He was uh, read a lot about King Arthur and the Round Table when he was a kid, uh, Spain's El Cid, uh, Beowulf. And then uh, later on, he moved as his uh, taste uh, kind of ripened to, of course, Homer's The Iliad and The Odyssey. And because he grew up during uh, the post-war era, World War I, he was also very uh, connected with stories of the war. Uh, there was a um, publication of the diary of a World War I American pilot, and it was a diary format, I think, that really influenced his subsequent uh, decision to present Guadalcanal Diary at, in a diary format. He was also attracted to the tales of Lowell Thomas, who wrote a book about a German uh, sea raider, Count Luckner, uh, who raided uh, uh, merchant ships uh, on the high seas uh, during the war. And then, of course, his subsequent career as a uh, journalist started at an early age. He was uh, only 15. The Great Depression had uh, worsened his family's uh, economic life. So he had to really hustle. Uh, to uh, you know, help pay for his education. He went to a couple of uh, local uh, private schools. And so he went out and decided to write stories about the activities going on at these schools, particularly sporting events that he sold to uh, area newspapers. And he continued this as he went on to uh, earn his degree at Harvard University. He uh, won scholarships, uh, but also became kind of the uh, Harvard correspondent for Boston area newspapers, uh, reporting on activities of the school and contributing stories to the uh, Hearst newspapers in the Boston area. And after he graduated and got a job uh, with the Boston Advertiser, there was uh, one someone who uh, became kind of his mentor, uh, a reporter named Freddie Perkins, who was a whiz at uh, doing rewrite, but also was very good at writing feature stories, uh, at least when he was able to get into the office. Uh, he was a World War I vet and sometimes drank too much and uh, couldn't make it into the office. But he taught Tregascus, Tregascus how to be a feature writer. And he also relayed the experience that, you know, 
there are sometimes in your life, there are a few days, a week, uh, or even a month, if you're lucky, that's as exciting as anything else in your life. And for him, it had been World War I. And these experiences were hard to come by, and you needed to grab them whenever you could. And I think that's really uh, what led Tregascus to wanting to become a war correspondent and go overseas and to experience what Freddie had experienced during the, the First World War. Guadalcanal earned the name Island of Death following World War II. The battle there left 1,600 Americans and 24,000 Japanese dead. What will readers of your book, Richard Tregascus, learn about the man Richard Tregascus and the stories that he told beyond those grim statistics so that those numbers didn't just become figures in a ledger book, but we understood they were real human beings? Well, early on in his experiences in World War II, uh, Tregassus had gotten a tip from Admiral Ray Raymond Spruance that the first great uh, land operation might well come in the Solomon Islands. So he always had this in his mind as he went on other uh, assignments in the Pacific, but he always wanted to go along with the landing forces if something happened in that area. And Americans decided to hit the island of Guadalcanal. Uh, with the 1st Marine Division, and uh, Tregascus managed to get on the transport uh, with the uh, fleet that, that was making uh, the landings. And uh, he really ingratiated himself with the uh, Marines who were doing uh, the actual operation. And he was only one of two civilian war correspondents, uh, himself for the International News Service and Bob Miller of United Press, to stay with the Marines after they landed on August 7th, 1942, uh, for the first seven weeks of the operation, which was a very near run thing. Uh, the American fleet had been pounded into submission uh, by uh, the Japanese Navy. Uh, a lot of the equipment was still offshore and the transports left and the Marines were kind of holding on for dear life during those early days on Guadalcanal. Uh, they were using the, the captured Japanese supplies for, for food and uh, other material. They're using captured Japanese trucks and uh, equipment to finish Henderson Field so they could get some air support. And Sergascus was there for all of this. Uh, when the Tokyo Express came every night to uh, shell uh, the uh, Marines in, in their dugouts, uh, Tregascus was there uh, telling uh, their story, experiencing what uh, they uh, felt uh, when the shells came down on them, uh, learned how to recognize you know, what shell would hit where, uh, where he needed to go for cover. Uh, he ate the same food uh, that the Marines ate only two meals a day during those uh, first few weeks until supplies uh, actually uh, came in uh, later on. Uh, but he was willing to always uh, be out there jotting down information uh, that he came upon uh, from the Marines in the small notebooks that he carried with him. He would you know, go out, talk to people, uh, get details about uh, what they were experiencing in combat, uh, put them in his notebook. He was a very assiduous note taker uh, during his time on Guadalcanal. Good for and you. Then, yeah, <laughs> then you need to do that. And then in the evening, he would go back and put all this information from his small notebooks into this large black gilt edged diary that he could then refer to later on because he always had the idea uh, that his time on Guadalcanal would make a great subject for a book. And he wanted to write a book uh, after he returned from his time on Guadalcanal. And he did so. And it became a, a bestseller, I think, because of the immediacy of his experience, his ability to always pick out those fighting men who would make great stories. And he did that throughout his career. And he picked a particularly good one on Guadalcanal uh, when he became very close to Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Merritt uh, Red Mike Edson, who was the commander of the 1st Raider Battalion on Guadalcanal. And he always seemed to be where the action was, uh, encouraging his men in battle against the Japanese. And uh, Tregassus came kind of a mascot for that the Raider Battalion and went with them on a lot of operations and was almost kind of like a good luck charm for, for them as they went into battle. As you're speaking about the 
Japanese at the time and from the American perspective. And then later we have Korea, we have Vietnam. These are all East Asian foes. And we know that the war against the Japanese in particular of the Japanese side, certainly one of the reasons that they attack, you look at things like the Bataan Death March, we forget about those things now and we feel, well, it was just terrible that there was a lot of, there was obviously the internment of the Japanese under FDR was, was inexcusable of people that were Japanese American, people that were Americans, forget the Japanese part. But a lot of that is is racially focused also because we look back and we read the, the writing at the time and it can be cringeworthy. And any person that you write about, you're a biographer, you know, familiarity can breed contempt. You see them sometimes at their worst moments. So I was wondering, just as we we're talking, as you were talking, Richard Trugaskis, when you went back and looked at his notes and looked at what he wrote, was he able to maintain that detachment? Was he able to write things that hold up even today that he was telling straight facts? Because a lot of these writers at the time felt like they needed to be part of the war effort. They needed to put down the other side just as brutally as they were they were putting us down. And that meant on both sides, often very, very racially horrible language. Right. So uh, how did he deal with that and describe them to the people back home? keep his own personality, but also not give in to what must have been really an overwhelming everywhere in the world at the time, in the air, feeling to portray the enemy as something less than human. Because of the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, I think there was that feeling among a lot of Americans, Dragassus included, that they wanted revenge from the Japanese who had uh, you know, made this sneak attack and uh, thrust this country uh, into war. And if you read Guadalcanal Diary and his dispatches as he sent back, uh, there is some, you know, racial language that uh, kind of makes you cringe today. Like he doesn't call them Japanese. He calls them, you know, Japs. And even when he was on the transport, bring the Marines to Guadalcanal, uh, you know, he um, was talking to Marines who were talking about, uh, you know, collecting Japanese ears uh, from dead Japanese uh, on the island. When there's very terrific fighting going on, and Japanese are cut down uh, left and right. He even admits in Guadalcanal Diary that, you know, uh, the first death you see might affect you, uh, but later on, they're just, you know, statistics. They're grim statistics of the war, and seeing the dead Japanese didn't really bother him that much, as much as seeing dead, dead Americans. Uh, but one thing about uh, Trigasics's work for Guadalcanal Diary is that it's very accurate, uh, it's something that you can turn to again and again for an accurate view of what life was like on that island on the canal uh, for the Americans, uh, because he's reporting on only what he sees firsthand. He's not a big picture guy. Uh, you don't know really about what's going on elsewhere in, in Europe, if you're reading Guadalcanal Diary, or the, the vast movements of armies and divisions, which is, you know, General George Marshall's war in Washington, D.C., no, you're getting that really foxhole view of the war, uh, that correspondents like Trigascus, uh, Robert Sherrod of Time Magazine, and of course, Ernie Pyle is probably the, the most famous of them all. Uh, they're getting that uh, very sharp detail of what they're experiencing under fire and seeing with their own eyes. You know, he wanted to go out and report on what he saw. Uh, he was not what uh, people sometimes call a communique commando that is a reporter who stayed behind the lines and only got canned handouts from public relations officers <laughs> you know he wanted to see for himself what was going on so people back home would realize the sacrifices and bravery of the men doing the fighting goes well with an observation i made in my head about the spending time with Marines and the language. If you're going to be spending time with U.S. Marines, you're going to pick up their language and you're going to pick up their resentment. And I think it's easy for us as civilians today to say, well, they said mean things. And even though the Japanese were uh, incredibly racist at the time and considered uh, anyone who wasn't Japanese basically subhuman, certainly look at what they did to the Chinese. But you you need that in war and in a soldier. And you need you can't look at the guy across and say, Gosh, yeah, I really, I really uh, admire their culture. I like it. This is part of war. Uh, you, you couldn't do your job. And if he's hanging out with Marines, eating the same food as them, that struck me as very key there too. He's, he's being one of them, and that 
that matters uh, to guys who are there fighting that he's not getting his pampered meals sent in and he's not staying far behind the line. So I, I admired that about him and the way he did his job. Yeah. Well, you know, was, I think it was General Sherman who said, you know, war is brutality and you cannot refine it. And I think uh, Trigascus learned that lesson very well during his time on Guadalcanal uh, when you had uh, experiences like the Goddard Patrol, where the Marines uh, had captured a, a Japanese soldier who told them that his companions uh, were starving and willing to surrender. So they put together this patrol with some Japanese language experts, but it was all a trap. And uh, everyone in the patrol, I think, except for one man, uh, was gunned down. And they also experienced the Marines on Guadalcanal that uh, sometimes you think a Japanese soldier has been killed and you go to investigate his body, but he's still alive and has a grenade that he throws to trying to kill as many of the Marines as he can, uh, giving up his life uh, in the process. It was just a, a brutal conflict, uh, no quarter uh, was given on either side. And I think uh, Trigascus and other reporters and war correspondents uh, captured that fact very well in their uh, dispatches back uh, to their uh, headquarters in, in the United States. You mentioned Ernie Pyle, who, who is Richard Trigascus' fellow World War II correspondent. Uh, Trigascus suffers a ne near fatal wounding when he's in Italy, and his friend writes about it, his colleague writes about it, and you've written about both men. So what was that moment like for you? I always picture things like that when you have two people you admire meeting up. It's like those comic book crossovers that we had when we were kids. You you get the, you always wanted to know who would win between Superman and the Hulk, right? So you'd see them fight each other. And, and that was real exciting. These are real life men. And it's it's at a tragic moment, not a fun moment but when we have Trigascus uh, injured in Italy. So what was it like for you as a biographer, but also what, what did that tell you having someone else write about your subject who wrote so much? Well, it's always great as a writer to find connections between uh, your subjects and your writing uh, when you've written one book about a, a person. And uh, later on, if you uh, switch to another subject, there's those connections that you can make between the two. And I always been a big fan of Ernie Pyle. I started out my career as a newspaper reporter, as he did, and really was inspired because I went to Indiana University in Bloomington, uh, which had his journalism hall named after Ernie Pyle. Uh, who went there uh, during his college days. So he was someone who always put on a pedestal for me and to find that he'd actually uh, gone out and written a column about uh, Trigassicus was something I had not known before I did research uh, for the book. And having a column written about you by Pyle was one of those rare things that could happen to you if you were involved in World War II. And uh, soldiers joke that uh, some of them would rather have Pyle write something about them than to win a medal for valor. It was that important to them. And there's even uh, a Yank magazine cover which has a cartoon with the soldier uh, holding an envelope in his hand and there's like a newspaper article spilling out from it and he's seemingly crying and two other soldiers talking and they say, you know, Ernie Pyle misspelled his name. So that's how important uh, Pyle was to the soldier. And to have that kind of a recognition by a colleague that Trigascus had in Italy after he was uh, severely wounded on Mount Car Corno, taken to an evacuation hospital and uh, wounded in the head, uh, paralyzed in his uh, right arm and leg. He uh, can't uh, speak correctly and really has to work hard just to get the right words out eventually. And to have Pyle come, come in to see him on several occasions uh, before he uh, finally wrote his column, I think was very uh, inspiring to him. And Pyle was not the only correspondent uh, who came to visit and offer encouragement to Trigascus during his stay in, in the evacuation hospital. There were other journalists as well who came by uh, to, uh, you know, give him a, a pat of encouragement on his back. Uh, but having that uh, column, that, that recognition, I think, uh, was uh, something that uh, really solidified his uh, Trigascus' reputation as one of the bravest of the brave war correspondents. Because as Pyle says himself in writing his article, if I had all this happened uh, to me, you know, I'd go home and rest on my laurels uh, forever. 
Uh, but Tregassus didn't do that. He went back into action, went back into combat, and continued to report on the war. You're enjoying my conversation with Ray Boomhauer. He's author of Richard Tregascus, Reporting Under Fire from Guadalcanal to Vietnam. Visit our guest at rayboomhauer.blogspot.com, and you can follow him, as I do, at Ray Boomhauer on Twitter. Military historian Richard B. Frank calls this book, quote, an excellent new biography that finally does justice to Tregascus in a deeply researched, thoughtful portrait of the man and his times. That's a very nice review, but the thing that jumped out at me as a historian, having read your book, I, I read Richard Tregascus and I say, I take up for this guy now, and I'm, I'm a little bit mad that no one wrote the story. So before you, I'm glad, though, that it felt to somebody of your talents and ability that really cared about him to write it, though. Better that than it should have been written about poorly. How is it that after the success, even of Guadalcanal Diaries in his own time, that it fell to you to do that justice that Mr. Frank described there and be the one to tell the story and tell the story of the storyteller, really, to your readers? Well, I'm glad that no one else had tackled this project because it was a great one uh, for me to uh, take on and, and to uh, write about for the University of New Mexico Press, uh, which uh, published the book last November. Um, but I was looking around. I'd written, of course, two other books about war correspondence, one on Ernie Powell we talked about. I also written about Robert Sherrod, who was kind of the Ernie Powell, the Marine Corps uh, during World War II and followed them through the Central Pacific. So I thought, well, it'd be great to have a war correspondent trilogy. And I was looking around for uh, other reporters to write about. And I had uh, read Guadalcanal Diary uh, when I was in high school. I was always a big fan of World War II and especially of the reporters uh, from that time period, like A.J. Liebling and many others. And I thought, well, you know, no one has written about him. Gaskus before. And I also noticed in doing some initial research that we share a birthday. We're both born hey. on November 28th. <laughs> so it seemed like I was fated to write about him. And so it was destiny calling my name. So I was able to uh, do uh, the research required to write the book and uh, tell his story for a new generation. I think that uh, Pyle is still remembered and put on the pedestal as the correspondent of the war, but I wanted to also put Tregascus up there uh, to have people consider him as well and all he had uh, done for the war. And perhaps others hadn't really tackled the project because they think that his own work on it was enough, that you had Guadalcanal Diary, a best-selling book that's still in print today. You had Invasion Diary about his uh, experiences in Sicily and Italy uh, during uh, the war, uh, talking about his wounding and then his uh, recovery at uh, field hospitals. So that, that might have been enough, but I thought there's a lot more to tell about his life, uh, not only in World War II, uh, but on uh, a little bit in Korea, but also a, a lot in v the Vietnam War early on during our involvement there as well. You mentioned Guadalcanal Diary, and that is also made into a film, though, even though his life story wasn't told here, Richard Tregascus. But I wanted to ask you, because we absorb so much from the movies about World War II, it being out of living memory now, that's only natural. You said something that I say that historians frequently say. We say we're uh, fans or readers say we're fans of the war. And then you you step back and say, it sounds like a weird way. But what we mean is, we're fans of the stories, the stories like the ones that Richard Tregascus told that you tell about Richard Tregascus in your book, Richard Tregascus. In 1943's Guadalcanal Diary, they depict it on the big screen. And I wanted to ask you, when you watch that movie in particular or any World War II film, what strikes you that they get right and wrong about the story? One of the things in watching Guadalcanal Diary that they get uh, very accurate is the camaraderie uh, among the American uh, soldiers, whether it be soldiers or, or Marines in, in Guadalcanal Diaries case, and uh, the connections that they make uh, in, in those tight spaces of combat uh, in, in a particular unit, you know, the platoon or a company, uh, whatever it, it might be. And they also get particularly well in Guadalcanal Diary 
just how important mail was to anyone who served in the military during World War II. And, uh, you know, a Jeep comes rushing in with uh, these sacks of mail and they throw out letters and uh, people share what the people back home have written to them. And there is the bitter disappointment of the one Marine who didn't get anything uh, in this particular shipment. And so they get that uh, uh, very well uh, represented in Guadalcanal Diary. And also just the terror of being under fire from the Japanese offshore. And they're taking cover in these underground bunkers, not knowing uh, if they might be alive in the next moment, uh, what shell might have your name on it. And uh, there's this you know, alive. Uncer <laughs> uncertainty of that and uh, whether they're going to live or going to die. And uh, the uh, things that they share when they're under fire like that. And so although some of the dialogue is kind of hokey, uh, when you go back and look at it from a modern viewpoint, uh, some of the scenes uh, capture combat uh, very well. And there are particular, you know, uh, bits and pieces that you can draw from the movie that are taken from Guadalcanal Diary. Unfortunately for Tregascus, who had always had a kind of a goal, uh, maybe after his uh, career as a journalist, he wanted to uh, become a screenwriter and go to Hollywood, which he eventually did after the war. But in this case, he really wanted to go to Hollywood and, uh, you know, return from Guadalcanal and actually work on the movie uh, from his book. But that did not happen for him, unfortunately. I want to mention the Korean War because it's it's called the Forgotten War for a reason. And I was just about to say it's easy to forget. I interviewed Deborah Cohen about her book, Last Call at the Hotel Imperial, the reporters who took on a world at war. And that's about World War II as well. So these people in her book, the men and women are colleagues of Tregascus. So she was kind enough to submit a video question about your book, Richard Tregascus. So let me roll those and I can ask you to respond. Ray, I'm really looking forward to reading the book. And thank you, Dean, for allowing me the chance to ask a question. Um, so Ray, my question is to how, goes to how um, Tregascus actually coped with censorship during World War II. And I'm curious about the extent to which his diaries differ from the published books. Of course, as an American correspondent accredited by the War Department uh, during World War II, uh, Tregascus had to deal with being censored. All his dispatches had to be reviewed by a public relations officer. And of course, these censors were cautioned uh, before they were uh, you know, assigned to their, to their duty as a censor. You know, we're going to judge you not on what you let through, but on what you don't let through. We want to be sure that no information is released that might give aid and comfort to the enemy. So sometimes uh, there are aspects of censorship that you kind of shake your head at today, wondering how in the world did that censor determine that that would, you know, be any problem. And Tregascus, uh suffered from this. Very early on, he was sent uh, to Honolulu by the International News Service. He traveled from California to Hawaii on a, uh, a former luxury liner. And on his way there, there were a lot of people on that ship who had suffered, never been on at sea before and suffered from seasickness. And one of the uh, sailors on the ship recommended lemon drops as a cure. And he was writing to dispatch uh, to send back home uh, about his experiences on that voyage. And the Navy censors cut that out of his article. <laughs> and they also wouldn't let him use the uh, names or hometowns of the enlisted men on the ship. The officers, yes, he could, but not the enlisted men. And he wondered, you know, why, why, why would not let him use those names? And they said, well, you know, if the Japanese got those names, they could figure out what ship they were on, and then they could figure out where they were in the Pacific. And uh, Tregasis wondered, well, if they knew all that information, we're in real trouble because <laughs> that's a lot of sensitive material to have on hand. Uh, later on, uh, when he returned from his uh, weeks on Guadalcanal, he had all this material, not only about his time there, but his uh, other trips, earlier trips in the Pacific, where he was on the task force that launched the Doolittle bombers, uh, bombing Tokyo. He was on the USS Hornet 
during another turning point in the war, the Battle of Midway, and of course, his time on Guadalcanal. So all this secret information in these uh, big black diary. And he had to use that diary in order to write his book. Uh, well, the navies uh, were very worried, and there were spies in, in Hawaii, that all this secret material would get into the wrong hands. So they made Tregasas come to the Navy headquarters every day, and he could use the diary there to write his manuscript. But every night that diary was locked up again in a safe, so it wouldn't get into the wrong hands. And uh, there are some times in the book uh, that things were cut out. And one in particular, uh, Tregascus described one of the Japanese camps as having a uh, slightly sweet smelling odor. And the censor cut that out. And Tregascus wondered why that maybe uh, that would mean that the Japanese would start using the special brand of deodorant so they wouldn't have that that smell that would uh, tip off uh, Americans to where their camps were. So uh, he had to deal with censors. And unfortunately for him, early on in the war, he was dealing with the Navy, which was uh, the service with some of the toughest censorship uh, during wartime. And uh, he also found out later on that uh, whenever there was uh, an action imminent or if there were reverses being suffered by the American cause, that's really when censorship was clamped down on correspondence. Uh, and that's when um, they really couldn't write what they wanted to write. Of course, during World War II, correspondents knew very well what they could and couldn't write about. Uh, they were all, you know, we're all on the same side here, you know, all wanting to defeat Nazi Germany and the Empire of Japan. And uh, there was a belief that uh, there were certain things going on in combat that the American public wasn't ready to hear about. And so some of the more brutal elements of being in combat were kept from the American public uh, for uh Quite some time early on during the war. You really didn't see any photographs of dead Americans until about 1943. And really it wasn't until the Battle of Tarawa, where you have a lot of these Marine combat correspondents filming the action and making a documentary, uh, that you really see the brutalities of the war. And uh, Robert Sherrod, who was on Tarawa, wrote a best-selling book about it, actually came back and had a meeting with uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the president in the White House, and encouraged him to release this film because he had really a sentiment that the American public really needed to get a wake-up call about what was going on in the war and uh, the kind of uh, sacrifices being made on their behalf overseas. And so that film was released uh, to great acclaim. You have that right in the middle of his two experiences. I think we think of Vietnam and World War II. Uh, obviously, in time, they're very far apart. They're very different. The technology is different. The stakes are different. It's a different foe. But Korean War is not that far out. That is not that far away from the World War II. Some people call it the last battle of World War II, right? So, how does he deal with having to go back to this? What what seems to be a a smaller war, but definitely a, a very dangerous one. They're they're just flooding. If he could, he could be pushed in back into the ocean along with the defending forces in South Korea. So when he goes over there and he deals with with that war and covering that war, how is that different from a World War II experience? And what will readers of your book learn about that? Because I'm just teasing it here. I, I didn't have we don't have time to to go into fully his amazing career. You did that in the book, but give us a taste of that. What was his experience reporting from Korea like? I have to go back to you know his experiences during World War II. While he's doing all this and he's going all over the Pacific and, and into Europe and into Nazi Germany. You know, he's dealing with a debilitating illness because he was diagnosed with diabetes uh, before he went overseas as a war correspondent. It was a disease that ran in his family. And he treated this illness uh, during his time in World War II uh, by regulating his diet. He didn't take insulin, which was available at that time. And after his experience in World War II, uh, he had uh, switched to an insulin regime, and he was having trouble early in the 1950s in regulating his his uh, his disease. And so he didn't go right away 
uh, to Korea when the war broke out in the early 1950s. And by the time that he was ready to go and actually had written the Associated Press and other newspapers, you know, that he was willing and ready and he thought that he could bring uh, a new perspective uh, to reporting from the, the war, uh, the armistice was signed. But he did go to Korea uh, and he was hired by the U.S. Information Agency and uh, went along with about a crew of eight U.S. signalmen to do a documentary from Korea on the contributions during that war made by smaller countries who were part of this uh, military alliance to beat back the uh, North Koreans and in their invasion of South Korea. Uh, nations like uh, Greece and the Philippines and, and others as well, including Australia and Great Britain. And when he went to Korea, he was under the impression, you know, that he'd read all these reports from Americans who'd gone there, who had, you know, called it a police action and were very thought, very uh, uh, unsure that this was really, you know, something that we should be doing, that uh, you really hadn't done anything of significance that just ended in this uh, tie. Uh, a lot of them said, and uh, the American troops didn't know why, what they were doing over there kind of a precursor of what the American troops felt about Vietnam. But in talking to the smaller contingent of troops sent by these smaller countries, uh, Tregassus came to realize that uh, this was very important and very important part of uh, the international order that uh, while they called it a police action, uh, he's talked about, you know, if we had this kind of international police force that we have at this time in Korea, uh, early on uh, before World War II broke out, this great catastrophe might not have happened. And he was very, very impressed by the skill and bravery shown uh, by uh, the troops sent overseas by uh, the smaller countries. And uh, that really comes through uh, in his writing about his experiences in Korea. So he didn't get that great chance to get into action, uh, but he did get a sense of what the world was going through and became very concerned about uh, the growth of communism and that's what really influenced him to going to Vietnam and reporting from there in the early 1960s, because he saw the uh, Mao Zedong's victory in China as kind of the Pearl Harbor of World War III, where all these smaller brush fire wars would break out in the battle against communism. And he thought it needed to be stopped in Vietnam, and that's why he went there. Richard Gaskis passed away just 56 years old in 1973. You spoke earlier about the idea you, you might pack so much excitement into a day or a week or a month of your life. He packs a lot there into those 56 years, he does. Writing about a writer's great, we, we mentioned in passing how much he left behind that you could read, but you also had the opportunity to interview his widow who just recently passed away. So when you approach somebody like that, I, I wonder what that's like. Sometimes people can be very open there. They've been waiting for your call. They want someone to tell their, their husband's story or their story. They have all these things piled up from their, from their father and they don't know what's going to happen to it as they're at the end of their life. And, and it's just going to maybe go in the trash mm -hmm. or sometimes they don't want to talk about it. And you have to do work as a journalist to get them to open up. So tell us a little bit about her and how she helped you write your book on Richard Tregaskis. Well, Moana was very helpful in the whole process of, of writing about her, uh, her late husband. Uh, she was his uh, third wife, and he really found happiness uh, with her later on uh, during his lifetime. And she uh, uh, lived in uh, Honolulu. Uh, still lived in, in Hawaii. So I couldn't go and visit her. So thankfully, of course, there's email these days. And so I was able, when I uh, came upon uh, questions that I had about uh, Tregascus's life, I could uh, send questions to her. And she was always very helpful in responding and giving me details about the last years of his life. Of course, you know, she wasn't around for those World War II experiences he had overseas. But she did go with him to Vietnam on a number of occasions. He kind of trained her as a war correspondent, and she went into various uh, battle zones uh, later on after he died and kind of served as his photographer. 
uh, during uh, the Vietnam War. And there are great photos of him uh, with his uh, big black diary. He'd gone away from carrying those small notebooks into battle, but just kept that big black diary that he put his information on uh, so he could uh, write his book, Vietnam Diary. Uh, that uh, came out in the uh, early 1960s. And she was always a, a great help to him. And she was a great assistance to me in uh, doing my book. Uh, fortunately, he left behind large quantities of material about his life at two repositories, one in Boston, the Gottlieb Archival Research Center at Boston University, and another one in, at the University of Wyoming at the American Heritage uh, Research Center there that has a, a large collection of his material, including something that I was just delighted to come upon in that he had started writing uh, a memoir and he had gotten up to about his uh, experiences in World War II uh, at Aachen. And so that was a great resource to draw upon about his early life because there was not a lot uh, out there available uh, about his days growing up uh, in New Jersey, his uh, time with his family and his uh, sister uh, Madeline as, as well. So all that gives, I think, a fuller picture uh, of what he was like uh, as a young man and uh, those uh, early, um, you know, things that shaped his character that are so important in writing a biography. I have another question for you from Deborah A. Cohen. Again, her book was Last Call at the Hotel Imperial, and you can watch or listen to that interview in our archives. So here we go, and I'll give you another chance to respond. Um, I actually have a second question, too, which is, what differences do you see between his war reporting on the Second World War versus the Vietnam War? To what extent? Um, and how did his reporting change between those two wars? Thanks so much again for allowing me to ask a question. Well, in World War II, uh, you had, of course, uh, the censorship clampdown on a number of journalists who were reporting from uh, the war front. And, but there was a sense of everyone being on the same side. And that kind of spirit changed a bit from World War II to when he went overseas to Vietnam. And he had some run-ins with some of the uh, younger correspondents who were reporting on the war uh, for uh, American news services at that time in the early 1960s. Of course, this is before the big American commitment of combat troops to South Vietnam. Uh, the troops that were there were American advisors. We're talking about 10,000 to 12,000 uh, men who were helping train uh, the South Vietnamese, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the Arvin. Uh, so when uh, he went over there, uh, he connected with a young correspondent named David Halberstam, who of course is very well known today for his reporting early on from the war. And these young correspondents were questioning, you know, some of the tactics uh, that we were uh, using in the war, uh, if we uh, should be supporting uh, the South Vietnamese government of uh, ZM and uh, doing some questioning that uh, reporters in World War II did not do. And uh, there were some run-ins with Halberstam and uh, Tregascus. In fact, after a day going out into the Mekong Delta area and Halberstam introducing uh, sources that he had to Tregascus uh, because Tregascus was a hero of him. He had read his reporting uh, from World War II, read Guadalcanal Diary, and had always uh, thought he was uh, someone to look up to. They were coming back uh, after a long day and uh, Tregaska said, supposedly, Halberson said, you know, if I was doing what you're doing, I'd be ashamed of myself. And it shows the clash in generational styles between uh, the reporters who were doing the work early on in the war in Vietnam and the World War II generation that, uh, you know, this was a new kind of war. Uh, where in World War II, uh, the front lines were well-defined. That was not the case in Vietnam. You know, you could be sitting, you know, having a drink in a bar in Saigon and have a, a gorilla throw a grenade inside and uh, kill people. So you never knew uh, where the next shot was coming from. I'm so glad that Deborah Cohen asked that because 
you get to see this evolution of the world. And this is what a storyteller does. But from when he's in World War II and there's people telling him, you have to tell the you have to tell the American line, tell the American government line. And then by the time he gets to Vietnam, he has people telling him, you have to speak out against the American line. What they're doing is wrong. And neither of those are, are all bad or all good. And it's, yeah, right. But it's that evolution that is fascinating to me about this man that you, you introduced us to here in Richard Tregaskis. Thank you, Dean. Uh, I have one final question for you. The news is called The First Draft of History, and for good reason. Why should readers pick up this book to get to know Richard Tregaskis, to meet the man, to experience his times through his eyes? This is a man who really wrote that first draft of those times as different, as divergent, as World War II, then getting there in Korea, covering our allies, which people forget that this was a UN act action in in Korea, then going to Vietnam and dealing with that at the beginning of it, not just the big set piece battles we think of when LBJ is sending so many men over there and the jungles, as Eisenhower had warned, is swallowing up our divisions, all those. He, he gets there at the beginning. So we learn about the genesis of the things that we hear about later that we've seen in films about that war. So why do you pitch or how do you pitch to readers and say, pick up my book, meet Richard Tregaskis, read about the man who wrote that first draft of history and get an idea of the man and his times that you don't get from reading second, third, fourth hand accounts of history. Well, what I try to get across to people uh, is the fact that uh, we have some privileges today that were, you know, won because of bloodshed by uh, generations uh, before us. And uh, Richard Tregaskis captures that very well in his writing about World War II and continuing on into the uh, Vietnam conflict uh, as well. And I want to get across the idea that uh, journalism has taken a, a beating over the uh, recent years uh, with the wild claims about being the enemy of the people. And, you know, that is not the case, that uh, these journalists uh, risk their lives in, in telling the truth as best they can in very dire circumstances. And uh, Richard Tregaskis was one of those journalists who was doing that and doing it well in a very dangerous uh, occupation and uh, doing everything he could uh, to report on what the fighting men and getting their experiences back uh, to the public at, on the home front. And it's something that continues today. It's a tradition to be proud of. And he's just one link in a long chain of uh, journalism uh, that has a, a proud uh, history and one that needs to be remembered and, and read today. Well, I think if people pick up the book Richard Tregaskis and then when they hear the name journalist or when they go into journalism themselves, and I have a history in journalism myself, so if, if they aspire to and if the people in public see this man as that shining example, this is a great one for us all to follow, for to aspire to, but also to mm -hmm. picture when we picture what journalism is and really is and was supposed to be always. Richard Dragaskis reporting under fire from Guadalcanal to Vietnam is the book. Thank you so much for joining me today, Ray Boomhauer, to share this story. I wish you the best of luck with the book. I really do highly recommend it, especially to fellow World War II fans out there, but really to anybody who cares about our world, cares about how it's reported, and cares about the men and women who risk their lives to bring us the stories of our men and women who go to fight. So thank you again so much, Ray. I really enjoyed the conversation and I enjoyed the book. Dean, it was great talking to you. You do a great job in all your interviews and I really uh, rely upon them uh, uh, as time goes on. I'm honored. Thanks so much. I, I like your books. I want to have you back again. And it's, it's really always going to be special, more special now to see you there on Twitter. I hope people will follow you there and enjoy your work. Your work is great. So thanks again for sharing it. Thank you, Dean. I appreciate it. Again, the book is Richard Tregaskis, Reporting Under Fire from Guadalcanal to Vietnam. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. By buying a book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My sincere thanks to Ray E. Boomhauer for joining us and for introducing us to one of the great war correspondents of the 20th century. 
Remember to visit him at rayboomhauer.blogspot.com and to follow him on Twitter at Ray Boomhauer. If you enjoyed watching this conversation, please do subscribe to our YouTube and Rumble channels. You can do that. You can check out some of the ones in our archives too, some of the interviews. There are about 250 there now, so you're sure to find a time travel adventure that fits for you. They're not all video, but even the audio ones, I have to say, first and foremost, I'm a radio guy. You will enjoy. One of those conversations, by the way, is with Deborah Cohen, who joined us to discuss Last Call at the Hotel Imperial, the reporters who took on a world at war. I really have to thank her. She was nice enough, even though she was having some computer problems at the time while she was traveling, to submit that video question for Ray Boomhauer today. These are both excellent books on the men, and in the case of Deborah Cohen's book, The Women, who brought us this first draft of history in World War II, even when it meant risking their own lives. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you enjoyed this journey into yesterday. Until that next trip into the past together, on behalf of Ray Boomhauer, thanks so much for time traveling with us today and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.